Yo, what is good guys? Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, thanks for joining us and let's get right into the video. So for those of you who don't know, I've been around Minecraft since 2012, eight years, and I've seen Minecraft grow from being a small block game to one of the best selling games of all time. And while I do have countless stories to tell over that long time, none come quite as close to this one. Now this story has Twitter trends, player riots, huge press coverage, boycotts of the game, and even Notch, the founder of the game himself, waiting in. But to really give this story justice, we've got a wind the clock all the way back to 2014. So if anyone's watching this and has been around since 2012, 2011, you'll know that Minecraft multiplayer has obviously not been like it is now um, for all of Minecraft's history. Back eight years ago, things were a little bit less advanced is I guess a nice way to put it. Essentially, the servers that were forming were kind of like survival plus. So they were using plugins to kind of add to the base of what Minecraft already had. And so these servers, they would have referred to as like MCMMO servers, economy servers, creative servers, and they were pretty basic. And that was pretty much what the multiplayer landscape looked like in like 2011, 2012. It was really, really basic with large servers um, in comparison for that time, but what we would consider tiny servers were, you know, today in 2020. So these servers did offer fairly expensive ranks. So if you were at like an MCMO server, they would offer you like an XP buff or like a slash kit type deal where you type slash kit diamond, for example, and then you receive a full set of diamond. And these kits were, like I said, fairly expensive. Some servers had ranks that would go up to $200, uh, which is a lot considering Minecraft itself costed like $21 back then. But that was essentially how those servers made money and really stayed open. And some of these servers actually did get particularly large, at least again, large for back then. A good example of this is the hardcore server, which was one of the largest Minecraft networks back in the day. Uh, and by large, I mean, it had about 3000 players like at max peak capacity. And they actually connected, they were one of the first sort of networks, what we consider networks today to connect servers together. So they had five servers, HC main, HC eco, HC creative, HC PVP, and they all had ranks ranging from 25 to $200. And back then, then there was no such thing as like a network rank. So each server, HC main, HC eco, all these different servers each had their individual set of ranks. And if you transferred from one server to another through their hub, you would actually not have a rank on the server you were transferring to unless you separately bought that rank. Now this is of course very, very different than how it is today, network ranks, but we'll get to that in a bit. So in 2011, 2012, these were the type of servers that were really prospering, were really the start of large multiplayer on Minecraft. And, you know, HC did really well. Like I said, they hit about 3,000 players, which was huge back then. But in late 2012, early 2013, we started to see a shift in the multiplayer sort of landscape towards less time consuming games, what we referred to back then as mini games, which is uh, kind of taken for granted today, but was like a huge thing back, you know, back then. So servers like Hive MC, Shotbow, and Minecade. Undoubtedly, a lot of you have heard of Hive MC, but Shotbow and Minecade are both either not around anymore or very, very small, so probably unheard of. These were like the mini game networks back in the day. Now they offered ranks generally for a lower price that were network wide. So that was already sort of revolutionary. Now, of course, what these servers were offering was very, very different to what the Survival Plus servers were offering. These servers were offering small mini games that you could play in like 10 minutes, hop on, hop off. Minecade actually had one of the most popular, most talked about mini games back in the day, which was essentially Minecade's take on Super Smash Bros. So porting Super Smash Bros. into Minecraft for a time, the most popular mini game in all of Minecraft when it launched. And as far as their ranks actually go, the gameplay was slightly more fair. So the ranks wouldn't give you such a large like pay to win advantage. Now that is not to say that they didn't offer you a gameplay advantage, but the difference between like a non-ranked player and a ranked player was much smaller whenever these mini game networks started coming 
around. And this all coincided with what I refer to as Minecraft second generation of YouTubers that focused more on snappy, funny commentary. You are familiar with a uh, YouTube channel referred to as the syndicate project that is kind of what I consider the first generation of youtubers that focus more on like survival um, Long streams stuff like that this second generation again more snappy more funny commentary So youtubers like captain sparkles Bajan Canadian and venom Those were kind of the new generation of youtubers that were becoming very popular and getting a lot of attention because they were playing on these mini game networks with very quick very trendy video by two 2014, the largest Minecraft network was Mineplex, and for those of you who don't know, Mineplex was actually founded by a player named Spoo. Spoo, ironically, was actually a former moderator on Minecade, so it's all connected. But Mineplex actually kind of rose to notoriety because it merged with a network referred to as Better MC, and so it picked up a really star developer from them. And then Mineplex was actually the first network to really form a strong partnership with a YouTuber. So Mindplex partnered with Captain Sparkles to promote Mindplex content to his YouTube audience. They started raking in 15 to 20,000 players per day and obviously that comes with hundreds if not millions of dollars of revenue. Now large multiplayer networks had never been more popular at this point. Obviously compared to today where we see a network that has at times over 100,000 players it might seem small in comparison but at the time to reach 20,000 players online at the same time was a huge huge deal and this was only two years after the like record the highest you could get as a Minecraft network was 3,000 players so that's you know almost 10 times larger than what they were hitting two years ago. Now, Mojang's end user license agreement, their EULA, hadn't really been on the forefront of people's minds. It's kind of like all of those license agreements that you click through whenever you download a fresh app or, you know, join someone's website or game. You're just like clicking, accepting the privacy policy, all that stuff. So people really obviously don't read through that sort of thing. Very key statement in Minecraft's EULA that had really gone unenforced for years said that, with regards to modified versions of the client and or plugins, you can do whatever you want with them as long as you don't sell them for money or try to make money from them. Now, this had, you know, as I said, gone relatively unenforced for years since Minecraft launch in 2009, but everything changed when the fire nate Everything changed when Mojang employee Eric Bros, who goes by Grum, commented on a Reddit thread. You cannot make money with Minecraft without our permission. We'll most likely crack down on that fact that most people give perks for donations, which under most laws would be considered a purchase. Essentially what he's saying is as Minecraft's EULA stood, servers could only accept donations, which as we've already covered, this is not what had been occurring in the community. Now there was a response to his original comment on that Reddit thread saying, Minecraft relies on its servers and YouTubers and saying that essentially the way that the community had become, while it wasn't the original intention of Mojang, it just was essential to the game. In which Grum also replied, no, it doesn't. Minecraft still sells 10,000 copies a day. Now, these comments quickly sparked what I would call the largest backlash in all of Minecraft's history. Users began comparing Mojang to Electronic Arts, or EA. Now, the next day, actually, after these comments were on Reddit, the hashtag Save Minecraft began trending on Twitter with over 500,000 mentions, which is obviously a huge deal. As far as why different groups of people were really outraged by what Grum had said, server owners, which is probably the smallest group of people we can talk about, were really upset that suddenly Mojang had plans to enforce a policy that hadn't been enforced for the past five years. Players, you know, all these thousands and thousands of players that were playing on servers like Mindplex, HiveMC, Hypixel, Mindcade, all of those servers, they were concerned that their favorite servers would shut down because it was pretty much impossible for these servers to operate just solely on donations. And then content creators were really, really pissed over a company they saw as being ungrateful for essentially the millions of hours that they had given to Mojang in unpaid advertisements. So all of those YouTubers who had supported these networks through videos and essentially supported Minecraft at, at the same time, 
that's unpaid advertisement for Minecraft regardless. Now, this is actually really interesting to me because if you're familiar with other games and sort of how things work, like if you've ever been familiar with the Star Wars Battlefront 2 controversy, usually players fight against features that they view as pay to play. But in this case, players were kind of fighting for pay to play to some extent. Now, it's not exactly the same and I'll get into like the nuances of that in a bit, but it is just an interesting note. Within 24 hours of this Twitter trend, Jeb actually weighed in, saying, Minecraft hosting has become increasingly rogue, and they mainly target kids, which ends up looking bad for both Minecraft and Mojang. A lot of these conflicts end up at the Mojang support office, and we've been ignoring this issue for too long. And that's it. That ended the rage, and that's the end of the story. <laughs> No, it's, it's not the end of the story. So players latched onto the statement, Minecraft hosting has become increasingly rogue, and took that as trying to say, Mojang was essentially trying to crack down on anyone who was hosting a server. And this was really, really relevant because Mojang had just a month earlier launched their alternative to server hosting, which was referred to as Minecraft Realms, which is essentially Mojang would just host a server for you and you would pay them a monthly subscription. So servers essentially sort of interpreted all of this as Mojang's attempt to wipe out independent competition to their own service. Now, this was extremely controversial to say the least. Now, these comments and all of this drama became so intense that players started writing on the Lobby 1s of large networks, which were referred to at the time as the Lobby 1 riots. And it's actually kind of weird because these players were rioting in the servers that they were rioting for. So it's kind of a strange concept, um, but it did get a lot of attention for anyone who was not already paying attention to all the EULA drama while seeing, you know, 50 people spamming chat constantly talking about it definitely got your attention. But Mojang did finally issue a full throttled statement on June 12th stating, let's get one thing clear. We love it when Minecrafters host servers. Tiny or massive, running vanilla or modded Minecraft, we think they're all great. Over the past week, there's been lots of discussion about Minecraft servers and your right to monetize them. Legally, you are not allowed to make money from our products. There has been one exception to this rule so far, Minecraft videos. We are about to make a second exception, Minecraft servers. Then, in the rest of the blog post, Mojang essentially laid out what forms of monetization would be allowed after the new EULA changes. Servers would now be allowed to charge players for access as long as every player on the server was charged for access. They would still be allowed to accept donations like usual. They could provide in-game advertising or sponsorship opportunities, and they could sell in-game items that don't affect gameplay i.e. cosmetics, which is probably the most common monetization method that we see today. And then they also stated that all servers must comply by August 1st, 2014. Now, this seems pretty standard to all of us who have been in the community after this point, but it was very radical to all of the players at the time. And so the large network owners actually started to break their silence on the sort of changes and the EOLA drama that had been going on for the past few days. Now, remember earlier how I talked about how Mindplex was founded by Spoo. So Spoo, when he founded Mindplex, actually roped in his older cousin, who goes by the endgame name Sterling. And Sterling was the managing director for Mindplex at the time, and he wrote an open letter to Mojang. And in that open letter, he said, Up to this point, they have been very supportive and have shown approval for what we do, inviting us to exhibit and be on panels at Minecon. I explicitly talked through my server and ranks with their business team, and they gave me the okay. I think it is disingenuous to say this is to protect children while, at the same time, saying we can run ads for businesses in between games. He continued in an interview with the newspaper Polygon, I'm sure we'd be able to make it work if we had to, but I genuinely believe this will be bad for innovation and that a lot of smaller servers who are creating awesome content won't be able to cover their costs and will have to shut down. Some servers have experiments with the new rules and have been unable to make a sustainable business. Another server owner from GotPVP also weighed in. 
I think we could survive, but our quality would go down. Our new game modes would probably be generic and not very unique, as we wouldn't have the resources to develop new ones. Now, obviously, all of this craziness after the Twitter trends, after the Mojang responses, after the player riots was starting to catch the attention of very large news outlets. So we started to see articles pop up from the likes of Business Insider, Polygon, Kotaku, PC Gamer Magazine, and The Guardian. This actually caused the creator of Minecraft himself, Notch, to respond. We had discussions about it internally, and eventually had a big meeting where we said that yes, people running servers are a huge part of what makes Minecraft so special, and they need to be able to pay for their servers. Now, to some extent, this did quell the outrage. It's obviously a huge, huge thing to have the creator of the game address a controversy in the game, but there was still some resistance to the change. The owner that I talked about earlier from Got PVP actually said that Got PVP would not comply with the new EOLA and eventually got blacklisted and shut down because it refused to. Now, a couple of months later in September of 2014, as a lot of you are familiar, Microsoft actually ended up purchasing Minecraft for $2.5 billion and Notch as essentially publicly said that he would be leaving Mojang and Minecraft behind. And a lot of people actually don't know that one of the reasons that he stated that he was leaving Mojang and Minecraft was that whenever the EOLA drama went down, he realized that he was out of touch with his player basis and was no longer essentially the founder and owner that Minecraft really needed. After this point, you guys pretty much know the rest of the story. Of course, there's a lot of stories that come after this one, but as far as the EOLA goes, there's been minor tweaks every couple years, but this drama has definitely had a lingering impact on the community that I don't think a lot of people even realize or really appreciate. Today, we only really see one network that has truly excelled under these changes, that being Hypixel, of course. And I think that the words of Sterling may have been sort of a forewarning. A lot of small servers who are creating awesome content won't be able to cover their costs and will have to shut down. Now, I'm not saying that for sure, you know, all small servers have been wiped off the face of multiplayer, but we have definitely seen real consolidation in the Minecraft multiplayer space. If you look at Hypixel, it takes up 60 to 80% of large multiplayer traffic, which is crazy. And there really is no precedence for that going back through all of the previous eras of Minecraft multiplayer. There were always multiple servers that were fighting over that number one spot. And commonly there was sort of a number one server that stood above and beyond the rest of the servers but there were always servers that were vying for that position and you know could get very close to that position during certain times of the day but i think this really does beg the question were those server owners right has innovation and creativity as far as the actual gameplay in these multiplayer networks has that struggled under the burden of mojang's eola changes back in 2014. All right, guys, that's it for this video. If you want to see more stories like this on my channel, please, please, please do leave a like. If you want to see more content from me, I upload on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, so there's always fresh content coming out from me. And if you want to talk to me or keep up with everything I'm doing, you can always follow me on Twitter. With that being said, I'll see you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend and deuces.